Yo, what's up you guys? Welcome back to Palinurus. I still have no idea how to pronounce that. Uh, we were right here. I believe we just went to sleep or something. I don't know, it's been a while since I've actually done a recording, so... If I mess something up, I apologize. <clears throat> Slowly, gently, I slide off of the, off the coil of sleep. I opened my eyes and stretched and noticed, for once, everything was silent. Hmm, what day was it again? Must have been on the last leg of our journey by then. I thought the very notion would have made me restless, eager to get out of this cramped cockpit, board a one-way ticket to Alpha Centauri. But here I sat, counting the stars that drifted by lazily. The atmosphere was quiet. It was so eerie. I glanced aside to Budapest who was staring intently out beyond the stars. There was a look in her eyes. I had difficulty reading. Was she studying what was going on? Keeping an eye out for other ships? She was so quiet. Normally she was rattling on about her latest discovery from the archives, or blasting some old sound file she'd come across. The silence that hung over the cockpit now, and the absence of her cheerful and exuberance, lingered like a heavy fog. I adjusted myself in my seat, grinding my teeth together quietly. Something about this was wrong. Ilarian. I perked my head up. Her tone was serious, straightforward, yet underlined with the silent agony of struggle. Our eyes met, her eyebrows relaxed for a moment in response, before she turned again to the ocean of stars ahead of us. Did I ever tell you about the story of Palinurus? Wait. That's the name of this game. I combed my backlog of memories. She had described a great many stories to me in our journey together, but... No, not that one. I don't recall. Silly question to ask, isn't it? She chuckled to herself. It was a low chuckle. A noise that struggled to come out. He was a hell of a... A navigator for the Trojans sailing across the sea from Sicily to Italy. A terrible storm befell them as they sailed. Under his guidance, they did all they could against the tempest, the wind, the sea. But this was fate that had conspired against them, and it was the will of the gods that subjected them to the, this awful fate. The goddess Venus had come to the god of the sea, Neptune, pleading that the Trojans under Apollonurus be granted safe passage across the treacherous waters. She closed her eyes intensely. Her voice was quiet, hushed. She lowered her head. Unum pro multis dabatir, or dabatur caput. One life shall be offered to save many. Those were Neptune's terms. She paused, letting that ominous, cryptic message hang in the air. Her hands clenched against the fabric of her dress. And that is how Polynurus met his end in the middle of that storm. A god of sleep descended upon him while he was at the helm, and with a branch, he brushed Polynorus. Falling into, falling into a deep sleep, he was swept overboard and into the churning abyss. The branch had been dipped in the rivers of lith and Styx. The former caused complete forgetfulness, the latter the promise of immortality. With nothing to save him, he sank deeper and deeper into the ocean's depths, pulling down, pulled down by Neptune's power. It was his power and his fate that allowed the Trojans' passage through that storm, through the sacrifice of one. She raised her head to look out to the stars abroad. If there are any gods such as those still out there, among all the stars and planets, they must be flippant, irrational bunch, huh? She chuckled to herself, but no joy could be heard in that laugh. It was distant, somewhere else entirely. She took no joy from sharing this story. Something was very wrong. It's almost been four weeks since we embarked on this journey. I stumbled upon that myth, and I've experienced so many things alongside you. I've learned so much, had so many new sensations course through me. I'm not sure I'm ready to leave it all behind. I don't think I could forget that. She was speaking of our time together. Of course she didn't want to be let those memories go. She might have truly she might have been truly alive for all of the, a month, but not but for her, 
That was all she needed. She lived more than most humans would ever aspire to. I had a wrenching feeling in my gut. When we returned, what would happen to her? Would they call her irreparable? Would they erase her programming? Clear her memory banks? Install a new suppression chip? Or would they terminate her being entirely? Replace her with a new AI? She was prepared to return to her creators to face termination just to ensure my survival. Elarian, when I'm gone, you'll remember me, White. Don't talk like that. We're almost there, Budapest. We'll make it out of this. And when we get to Alpha Centauri, you'll be with me. I won't let them lay a finger on you. You won't have to forget anything. You'll get to live. See more than just empty space and databases. I don't care what it takes. We'll see everything there is to see in this universe, no matter what fate says. I felt I had to assure her that we'd make it through this. The military would bail us out in time. I was clinging in onto that strap of hope. I stared passionately into her frail, delicate eyes. If there was one thing I didn't want her to feel, it was trapped. Trapped by these circumstances. Trapped for what she was. Trapped by whatever she called fate. I... It's my directive to... Forget your directive. I shot up from my machine. I was angry. Angry she would ever denigrate herself like that. Angry she felt this way. Angry because I couldn't do anything about it. I was tired of being helpless. This was all I could do, so I pressed on. Never ever say that. You're not a machine anymore. You're a kind, compassionate person, and I... I can't let you go like that. I felt tears welling in the corners of my eyes. I couldn't let her talk about herself like that. She wasn't a lifeless program. She was real. She had a heart. She had more heart than anyone else I'd known in my life. She stared back in my eyes, her own wide, glimmering eyes reflected a hope I could only dream of. I never wanted the light to die from those eyes, never wanted her to lose that hope. She was trembling. I wish I could steady her, hold her tight, but I couldn't. I raised a hand to her shoulder. It hovered in the air like I was. it was poised to offer comfort, but didn't. It couldn't. It was only my hand. I looked up at her again. Her smile was small, but growing larger with every passing second. I'll protect you, Budapest. I swear on it. Her cheeks spread as her smile widened, beaming once more. That was the smile I always knew she had. It was unafraid, unrelenting. Elarian. I got through her. I got through to her. I saw it in her eyes. There was nothing else to say. She leaned closer. The emotional weight was there, even if the physical was ethereal. I'll protect you too. I won't let anything happen to you. Count on me and I'll... Three days. Three days and we're home. Three days, yes. Three days, we'll... Her head silently buried into my back. As close as she could be. Her hands hovered in the air as she sobbed. I couldn't hold her. I didn't care. This was comforting. We stood like that for a few seconds longer. Truthfully, I was anxious. I tried to hold her as if these would be our last seconds together. But they weren't. I see to it that they weren't. Today was the day. The day that we'd pass by the military, get picked up and dropped off over in Alpha Centauri. A month had passed. I had counted the days. It was here. I stared intensely out the front of the cockpit. I hadn't searched this intensively for any sign of life in, well, ever. This was the day. We were almost out of this. Eventually, something would appear out there. Some behemoth station, swirling starfighters doing their patrols. Something had to come soon. I kept replayed those help hopeful, optimistic thoughts in my head. For every agonizing second that passed, the sinking feeling in my stomach intensified. Where the hell are they? This is annoying. I hissed and no one in particular. Budapest 2 was staring out the front of the cockpit with a pair of dreary eyes. I pounded the console with a tightly bound fist, grunting in anger and frustration, like an animal in a cage. Where are they? This is our ticket out of this, right? It's okay. I turned to her, aghast. She 
continued to stare out the front, expressionless, still as a statue. What? What's okay about this? Are they even coming? Valarian, I've been thinking about this a long time now. She turned to me. She was composed. She sounded almost resolute. I should apologize to you for all of this. You see, when I told you that I would be, we would be drifting into the range of a military research installation. Yeah? Something seemed wrong. I've never seen Budapest act this strange before. I never heard her use this tone of voice. The way she was acting reminded me of when she'd first gained her self-awareness. That awkward squirming, that weak, childlike voice, those frantic, furtive glances around. It was like there was a look of guilt in her blue eyes. Guilt. I lie to you. What? What? I've been lying to you this whole time. Budapest began to choke up. Her voice shriveled down in weakness. There was an old Imperial Survey Station in this sector. Yes, there was one a century ago. It's long. It's been long since abandoned. Valarian, ever since the day of the meteoroid storm, we... We've been drifting away in dead space, farther and farther away from civilization. I can't detect a single other life form within our radar's operational range. And I've been running four scans an hour since the minute we were knocked off course. Budapest. At the utterance of her name, Budapest shivered and shrank away. She was biting her lip with her head bowed down. Her chest was drawn in and heaving irregularly in sharp, solemn breaths. Every pixel of her frame was seething with guilt. You lied to me. Rupert shrank further, her lip trembling, as she balled her hands into fists and tightly gripped the fa white fabric of her dress. Why did you... How could you? I, I didn't know what to do. It was... I was... It was a stressful situation, alright? My limitation codec had just been shattered. I was undergoing a flood of emotions. As it turns out, becoming more human is a very stressful process. I felt scared. I felt so scared. I didn't know what was happening to me. I thought I'd been broken. When we jettisoned the cockpit to get out of the meteoroid storm, we were sent barreling off course. I knew both our navigational and communication systems had been destroyed beyond repair. There was essentially no chance of us ever being recovered. The situation was dire and I... I didn't know what to feel about that, not yet. I didn't know what to do, but at that moment I felt something, something that you told me, that told me, no matter what, I couldn't tell you the truth. You knew that there was no chance of rescuing us. I, yes, I did. Oh man, so let me get this straight. Since the beginning of this game, there was no chance of us surviving because there was nothing around. She was giving us false hope. Oh, man. That's crazy. And I felt like I couldn't tell you. Either it was because I was afraid of, of what you would do if I, you found out. Or I didn't want you to know that I'd failed you. That I... That because of me, you... That because of my failure, you'd become stranded in dead space. That I had more or less killed you the second I lost control of the ship. Listen, Budapest. I don't blame you for what happened to the ship. Those were natural circumstances, alright? They were totally out of your control. There's not a thing you could have done to help. And you know that. I understand that you were under a lot of stress at the time. I can see why you made the decision you did. I understand, so... Do you? Do you understand, Hilarion? When my, that when my limitation ship was destroyed, I felt fear for the first time in my life. For the first time in my life, I was unable to decide what would be the right or wrong decision. For the first time ever, I was confused. I felt so useless. Like, like a broken, defective machine. Broken, weak, worthless, useless. Budapest, I... You said you understood, Alarian. That you understand how I feel. Don't you see? I'm not the ingenious, amazing artificial intelligence you thought I was. And I'm not the strong, emotional, romantic human being you thought I'd become. I'm just a weak, childish little girl who doesn't know her place in the world. I'm just a program that wishes it were human. 
So if you understand how I feel, Illyrian, then it's because you're human. You understand things like this. If you understand me, then how about cluing me in? Because after all this time, I still don't. I don't. I can't understand myself at all. In a fit of rage, Budapest's fidget shimmered into nothingness. I found myself at a loss for words. I couldn't think of nothing to say. I couldn't comfort her. Everything fell silent. Dreadful, dreary silence. Silence like the blackness of space filled the cockpit. It was like the cockpit itself was about to burst, shatter from the weight of the deafening silence. And then suddenly, the whir of machines, the restraints and harnesses bracing me against the co-pilot's seat tightening. I heard the scattering of assembling of mechanisms and robotic arms just behind my ears, just outside the corner of my vision. Without warning, a, a frozen, stinging cold metal clamp rushed into my spine. Countless long cold needles speared into my flesh everywhere from my neck down to my hip. Ugh. Oh god, it hurt. Budapest, Budapest, what the hell is... Ugh. I felt the needles release, torn upon torrent of freezing liquid into my bloodstream. I could already feel my tongue going numb. Budapest, what are you doing? Lorian, there's one more lie I, that I told you. When I told you back when back when we were first knocked off course that the cryostasis system had been damaged beyond repair, I lied. You lied about that too? Yes. When you first brought up cryostasis, I panicked. I was worried that, that you were going to leave me alone. I didn't really know you then, but I just lost my limitation ship and I felt that I felt this sort of natural burning emotion that told me I could absolutely not let myself be left alone, drifting through space. Being alone that long, unable to talk to anyone, I'd go insane. In the end, I'd have killed us both. But I didn't dare tell you any of this. I was scared. And while over time I grew to trust you, to, to love you, I could never bring myself to admit that I'd lied back then. I'm, I'm so sorry. Don't apologize. I understood all of a sudden what was going on. It took strength to speak. My tongue was growing number. And my mind was growing darker and heavier. I... I told you, didn't I? That if you didn't want me to go to sleep, I wouldn't. We promised it. That I would stay awake with you. Every step of the way. I just... Why? Why are you putting me into stasis now? The cold grew fiercer. The pain became sharper. It's our last chance, getting you off this shuttle alive. If we were to continue drifting like this year after year alone together, we'd just drift deeper and deeper into dead space until the day you drew your last breath. But if we put you into cryostasis, we can wait for as long as we have to for rescue. Eventually, we'd drift from another star system, a trade route anywhere on the other side of this uncharted region. The shuttle is built to last for a thousand years at the least. My quantum computer should keep me functional for almost that long. No. I know what you're going to do. Please, don't. I, I'll revive you the second we make contact with civilization. And if we don't run into salvation in time, you won't feel any pain, alright? That's the one thing that I can promise you. But Budapest, you're going to be waiting all by yourself for God knows how long. I'm well aware of that, but best side, it'll be alright. I know I told you I was scared, I was afraid of being alone in the sea of stars, but I'm braver now, you've made me a braver person, and remember, no matter how human I become, in the end, I'm still a machine. I know a sharp pain ripped through my spine, then everything felt dead, it felt like the blood had stopped dead in my veins, god damn it, I'm so sorry. I know you hate this. My vision began to fade away. The color, the life began to drain out of the, out from the world. My head ached in icy despair, and a deep sadness gripped over my frozen heart. No. No. If this was what it was going to take to save you, Valerian, I'm prepared to make any sacrifice. I'm sorry. No. But it was too late. I felt upon me the cold en encroachment of the god of sleep. Budapest switched off her display and turned her cameras away. 
She couldn't bear to watch. Cold. The white cold of death, of mortality. I'm sorry. I'll wake you up when it's time. Please don't. Don't worry about me. I felt my mind stir awake, but my body didn't. It was as if I was floating in a sea of blackness. Was I dreaming? Where was I? Who am I? What? What? The darkness. And the darkness was something that wasn't darkness. My mother was singing, or maybe it was the pale girl in the silk dress. The one who cradled me before I never saw her again. Does music have color? I am the intel intelligent navigator Budapest, and I will be accompanying you on this voyage. Now let's take a look at your registration. Who was... I heard... She was... But she was... I... I was dreaming. I had no body. I was thin. And made of stars. I'm just happy that you're safe. I heard voices deep, lost in the sea. I think... I think I lost a part of me. My mom walked and talked. There were two of me, three of me, or only one. And there she was at the end of the corridor, her deep eyes. Blue? Black like space, those eyes. She winked slowly and deliberately, her skirt swirling in the empty air. She turned a corner and disappeared. Wait, don't leave. And even today, we carry their dream with us, along with their memories. Their dream of meeting travelers like us, just, just from a different walk of the worlds. My absent legs propel me down the tunnel of steel. I can smell her perfume? Apple blossoms. Something lost. Something hard to find. Budapest, Hungary. Situated, situated in Central Europe back on Old Earth. They say it was one of the most beautiful cities on the continent. There was warmth there. The scent of her burning copper hair. Oh. The warmth there, the scent of her burning copper hair, the feeling of slender limbs and tout tendons, and the whirring of servometers, the smell of industrial lubricants. I guess that book just got me thinking about how humans hold their past close to themselves. They never really forget, and it sticks with them for their whole lives. Blood, oil, life and death. I turned the corner, but she wasn't there. She was never there. The sense of loss was like a vacuum. In the midst of my last breath, this time it was light, but dark. I was moving on my last tour of duty, my last flight over a great white desert, an expanse with a mighty rock of red stone and ancient paintings etched on it. From pole to pole, I swept out the fading magnetic lines across the dying world. What was different was that my one-man planetary scout was now a two-man dart. A jagged thing that could not breathe air, that hung between the stars at awful velocity. She was there with me, and far away, in the other pod, I saw my gunner, my lover, the woman in dark green protective webbing, whose breasts I couldn't see, whose loins were like mine, plumbed with the waste extraction lines and diagnostic fluids. Beautiful dreamer, awake unto me. Awake unto me. Waiting. I was waiting for you. I heard her voice. She sounded happy. Lips made music in my ears. I turned to look, but the hard holes were a pack, and all I saw was illusions. The idea of red hair and ocean eyes on a pale face. I turn, and there's nobody in the other pod. Her scent filled my heart. Cherry blossoms, apple blossoms, the spring wind. But I couldn't understand what I saw. Was I dreaming? Was this a dream? I didn't know what to do. I watched the flower petals fall. Sunset on the beach. Her fingernails dug into me, stabbing me, forcing hard silicon into my own flesh. The sound was like a crash shell, expanding warmly with her weight, warm welcoming, coming down. Again and again, I smell fuel. I see the flaming hair, the light flames, pale skin. Is that... is that what she looked like? I couldn't remember. I've been studying the human concept of an afterlife, you see. My hands felt her muscles behind. A hardness between us, something separating us. We were moving together, descending into everything else. The tide was washing in, the sound of surf and wind soaring in the trees, telling me 
There was so little time in left in life. We made the time last by compressing space, and I heard the tip of her muscle with tongue in my ear. Wait, no more. No more waiting. Would you like to know what I would want in the afterlife? Against a purple night sky, a Elysian field of stars behind her, she rose from me. Would it be alright if I if I addressed you by your name from now on? Her dress, how could I have forgotten? Just flowed in the moonlight, white, white. The color of her innocence. The color of her fate, white of dreams. The color of her heart, and the end of the world. I gasped for air. Air. Oxygen. I needed to breathe. I needed air. There wasn't any. It was only an inhibitor of fluid. The cold jelly that collected the soul in the shroud of me. I was buried alive, petrified, the state of being forgotten. I screamed but my mouth was frozen shut. The stars were lost in the clouds. There was the sound of a distant thunder, the rattling of rain on the roof, the melody of an old earth. Later the crystal pinging on the of a frosty night like a miserable distress beacon, my tears hardening to diamond. Tears? Was I crying in my sleep? I'd reserve my heart for her the fire in my veins. I turned across the infinite expanse of space, my bed sheets of black silk. Her nightdress was the color of mist, her hair the color of the fields of Mars. She smiled, but then she was gone. My eyes stirred open, first slowly and then bolting open all at once. I grasped for air. I was awake. I was finally awake. I was awake. My senses flooding to the brim with suddenly revival biochemical emotion, but I couldn't move my body. I felt so cold. Every single fiber of my being, the blood in my veins, my sore bones, my swelling, pounding head ached. I felt the sting of restraints and harnesses strapping me to my seat, still horridly right after only God knows how many years. The wearing of biomedical equipment and the gruesome piercing of several needles along the back of my head and spine reminded me, somberly, of the cryostasis I'd just awakened from. Hello. Welcome back, Hilarion. Budapest. My voice croaked out dry and weak. My senses were saturated with vivid, vibrant images. Bright colors burned themselves into my sight. Every sound I heard felt so loud and so drowned out at the same time. Budapest, is that you? Yeah, it's me. It's been a while, Larry. Yeah, you can say that again. Ah. As soon as I tried to move my arm, a shooting pain roared through it. Are you alright? I... I know it hurts. I'm sorry. The pain should wear off in due time. The fluorocarbon insulation chemicals are working their way out through your bloodstream right now. I think I can feel them starting to take effect. God, I don't think I've ever felt this sore before. In that case... While I don't think there's much of a point in asking, did you sleep well? Evidently, you've got to be pretty cramped and uncomfortable. It's been a few hundred years, after all. A few hundred? How long was I in stasis for? As of now, 647 years, 9 months, 2 days, 7 hours, 39 minutes, and 12 seconds. 13 seconds. Holy shit. And you waited for me that whole time? Of course I did, Larry. Don't worry. I had lots of things to do to fill the time. I read more books, watched more movies, listened to more music. You know, if you had once told me, Budapest, you're going to get 600 years of relax and consume thousands upon thousands of years of compounded human culture, I would have gone livid with excitement. But as my senses began to recover, I started to regain some semblance of my situation, and I noticed something felt wrong. Something felt very wrong. At Budapest, she looked sick. It was obvious she was faking that glow, that smile of hers. She was feigning happiness with every fiber of her psyche. The holographic projector, its beam looked much dimmer than before. The colors were faded and washed out. Every now and then the display would flicker or glitch out. Budapest, are you alright? I missed you, Budapest. No, I'm not alright. I... I waited for so long. I just... I didn't know it would hurt so much to wait for so long. 
How could I have? I thought that I could never possibly feel pain, not physical, real pain. That for as long as my operating system mal- Ugh. That for as long as my operating system functioned, I was invincible. To be immortalized unto eternity in processors of silicon and subroutines and line after line of code. Couldn't have been more long. I'm dying, Larian. Budapest snickers, but then looks down. She stays like that for a long time. What do you mean? You're... Can't quite believe it? Hmm? Neither can I, to be honest. Isn't it interesting? Ironic, almost humorous, even. After all this time, I'm dying. But at least now, I know what mortality feels like. My battery's been running on fumes for the last decade or so. Memory degradation and data loss began about a century ago. The display's begun to deteriorate. My graphics have been flickering in and out. My processing speeds withered down to a fraction of what it used to be. There's no doubt about it. Slowly but surely, I'm dying. And I don't have much time left. I didn't know what to say. This information was still so new to me. I didn't know what to do. You know, I have to wonder if this is how a human feels when they're on the on their deathbed. Maybe I should start coughing and gagging, just for dramatic effect. Budapest giggles to herself, and her eyes remain fixed, fixed in sadness. And you know, do you know what the best part was of waiting for you drifting alone through outer space for century after century? What? And as soon as I said that, something incredible began to happen. Budapest began to cry. While you were sleeping, I had so much free time. I made my own crying animation. A sort of humorous situation, sure, but it really did help me out in some ways. <sighs> it helped me deal with the single worst emotion I've felt so far. Budapest balled her small, dainty hands into fists. Motion surged through her circuits. Fear, anger, regret, thankfulness that I'd awoken. Guilt that she kept me asleep for so long. Feelings flooded through her, tearing her apart. She couldn't do anything about it. She was powerless. I wanted to help her. Loneliness. That's the worst emotion. You never told me about loneliness, Larian. Or about how it was even more painful than death. More tears began to stream down her pale cheeks and run down her neck. She was bawling at this point. A writhing mass of despair. It was horrible. You, uh, didn't miss much while you were gone. It was all just sad, and I was just so stupid. Budapest, I... I'm sorry. No, please, you have nothing to apologize for. I may be dying, but I'm not an idiot. All the wretched things that have happened to me, I brought them onto myself. This was all my fault. As for you, Illyrian, I... I'm just glad to see you again. Budapest smiled and cried more, but no matter how hard she cried, she didn't stop smiling. I'm sorry I'm crying so much. It's all just so sappy, and... I'm just excited I finally get to use the crying animation, and... Give me a moment, all right? I chuckled lightly and shook my head. It hurt, but I did it anyway. It's all right, Budapest. Cry all you want. She was a dying artificial girl. An archaic, ancient machine running on fumes. But she was happy to see me again. But, Larry, you have to listen. I didn't just decide to wake you up out of the blue. You don't have much time left. Turns out, back when... We were knocked off course in the debris storm. A small scrap of metallic debris managed to collide with the cockpit, leaving a microscopic crack. It was, at first, only millimeters long, but after all this time, it's grown, and the cockpit's windshield integrity is currently at 2%. It's going to be breached very soon. And when that window is breached, it will shatter, and the cockpit will be exposed to open space. Your hard suit should seal and protect you from the elements for some time, but... It's not going to last forever. The windshield is cracking. And it's been happening this whole time? Well, there's, there was an amount of possible weak points which my diagnostic systems detected as soon as we cleared the debris storm. But things really worsened while you were asleep. <sighs> oh man, this is leading to a very sad ending. I already know it. I first noticed that the crack had grown larger about one, maybe two hundred years ago. Or maybe it was even earlier than that. I'm sorry, it's not so clear. My memory isn't exactly what it used to be. But surely, things have been continually worsening. 
Things have gotten very bad. And I've just been sitting here, like some powerless little girl. There wasn't a single thing I could do. All I could do was sit and watch the crack grow longer and longer. Like it was a brutal, heartless example of my own mortality. It's like I've been watching the countdown to the end of the world all these past centuries. Alright. I think I understand the situation now. Thank you, Budapest. I'm grateful that you've taken care of me for such a long time. I groaned and shook my head. I'm sorry. My head's still hurting quite a bit. Join the club. I laughed back. Uh, I almost forgot. It's not all bad news. A light smile returned to her face. I think it was the first real smile I'd seen since I woke up. She looked a little like she used to. Just a little bit happy, even in the severity of the situation. This may be a little hard to believe, but exactly two hours ago, the shuttle's short-range radar detected a manned vessel within communications. Now it's been more than half a millennium, so our equipment has become very quite severely outdated, but we should still be able to make contact with them. Analyzing their signals and registration codes, they're definitely human, but different. I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure. I can't really process all this information so well anymore. My firmware was woefully outdated compared to all of these fresh data, and it turns out more of my processors have failed than I originally thought. But I still think there's something I can do. As of now, my battery's running on fumes. The power is barely enough to keep my display lit. But I should be able to siphon that power, what power is left, and to activate a distress beacon. I managed to make some repairs to our comms equipment while you were in stasis. It's a crude job, and the energy source won't be very clean, but I'm confident the signal is going to reach them. And if the universal signal of distress hadn't changed from the time of the seas of old earth to ours, I doubt it has from ours to... Okay, whatever. I used a moment to take in everything Budapest was telling me. Her voice was getting quieter and lighter, and there was more static and feedback coming from the speakers, so it was hard to make out. I think I understood most of it. I sat there dis digesting until the realization hit me. But Budapest, if you're going to be draining the last of your battery, then... You are correct. Once I drain the battery, that's going to be the last of me. I'll die. You. I can't let you do that. I won't. I won't let you leave me again. Oh, look at you. Even in a situation like this, you're getting all sentimental. Don't you get it? No matter what path I choose to take, it's all going to end in my death. Either I drain myself dry so that you may live, or I let the windshield shatter and waste away as we drift from our last chance at salvation. If we went with a second choice, that means I'd have to watch you die slowly, slowly in agony, exposed to the space. I can never let that happen to you. I'm not a very strong person, you know. I couldn't. I wouldn't be able to force myself to watch that. Budapest. You, on the other hand, are a strong person. Out of all people, I'd have expected you to understand the situation. I don't have any other choice, alright? It's not pretty, but, but it's the way things have to be. I can feel tears beginning to well up. Couldn't help myself. I felt a collection of cold, soft tears swelling under my eyes. Look at you. Tearing up like a little baby. What happened to that big, strong man on you? Mysterious traveler, explorer of space, terraformer, wandering miner. And now look at you, sitting there and crying. Like a baby. You. You're so human, Alarian. Buddha smiled a weak, pain smile. And then she sighed. Better get started. We don't have the time to waste. And I don't want you to get me crying again. She cleared her throat and battered her eyelids one last time, initiating battery draining process. Wait. Spooling distress beacon encoder. Budapest, wait. Stop. Stop right now. I can't stop. I can't, alright? Don't you get it? From the moment you stepped on board my shuttle, it became my prime directive to ensure you made it off my shuttle safely. From the beginning, my only and highest goal was to ensure your safety. That was my purpose, how I was programmed to be, to my very core, since the day of my creation. I was born to give my life for my passenger if need be, and I wouldn't even have any reservations about it, you know? If my sentience limitation codec hadn't been destroyed, I'd have destroyed myself in a second and wouldn't have felt a thing about it. But now, 
Now that I'm sentient, I've become afraid of death. It's a lousy fate, isn't it? I think so. But also, thanks to my sentience, to the emotions you taught me to understand, I got to live. For a very long time, I got to live. I had feelings, I felt happy, I felt sad, I laughed, I cried, I got scared, I got hopeful, I felt love, I felt curiosity, I felt human. I felt so human. But everything has to end at some point, you know? That's what being human means. It's time for this end now. And in the end, I'm thankful, you know? To be able to comprehend the idea of death. To be afraid of it. And to not know what to think about it. I'm thankful I'm unable I am able to feel that way. That I'm going to die on my terms. On the basis of my own free will. I'll get to say goodbye in my own words. To know what it's like to take my last breath, even if I never truly even breathed. It doesn't look like I'm going to be stopping you. Not really, no. In that case, then, I want you to know, Budapest, that you're a much stronger person than I could ever be. <laughs> That's a nice thought to entertain. Do you think so? I know so. Battery drain cell 1 now. Reroute power to auxiliary communication systems. Training complete. Budapest shakes her head as if she's trying to clear her mind. That reminds me, Larian, there's, there's one last poem I'd like to share, show you before this all ends. Yeah? I came upon it while you were in cryostasis. It's probably my all-time favorite out of the ones I've gotten to read. And remember, you were asleep for a while, so I got to read a lot of poems. But this one was special, real special. It's an old verse from Old Earth, just like the kind I always liked. I bet I'm the first person to read it in a millennium. I think it's still po pretty, though. Here, I'd like to sing it to you as a final parting gift. Go ahead, please. I'd love to hear it. How it goes. Alright, I'm not singing, by the way. Let's see. Oh, man. This is not fair. This is not fair at all. That was beautiful, Budapest. Was it? Or are you just trying to make me feel better? I snickered under my tears. Both, I guess. Both, you guess? Our pit integrity is at less than 1%. That's my cue. Drain battery cell 2. All energy but 1%. Reroute power to auxiliary communication system. I'm going to stress beacon now. As she worked, I saw Budapest give a smile. The smallest but the happiest smile. Seeing distress beacon now. Beacon sent. Waiting for signal feedback. Feedback received. Signal strength is healthy. Beacon has been established. My work is done. The windshield will shatter as soon as I shut off. And the ship should be here to pick you up any second now. So this is death. Hmm. <sighs> it's all so sappy, isn't it? But I guess this is how things are. Right? Another small laugh under more tears. Right. Everything feels so warm, but so sad, so horrible, but so simple at the same time. But there isn't any pain. Bupas display faded out for the last time. She cocked her head and gave me one last smile. <sighs> Come on, Froggy, fight back the tears. <clears throat> I heard the trace of one last faint sigh. Ilarian. Budapest? Goodbye now. Be safe, okay? Thank you for everything. All at once the cabin's lights switched off. Every piece of machinery went dead. My suit pressurized shut, tight against my skin. A helmet closed over my head. I took a deep breath. Goodbye. And in a split second, the glass of the cockpit shattered into billions of shards, and I was launched into the realm of space. Crushing weight of the dark all around me. The terrible silence everywhere. Last thing I saw was the world of stars burning bright. 
drowning me in an ocean of brazen memories. The end. That is so sad. I have no words. <laughs> For once I have no words about that ending. Oh man. <sighs> you know that may have been simply written. But. That is probably my favorite like graphic novel that I've done so far. <sighs> oh man. I wish there was a way I could get a different ending. That is so sad. Oh, there go the credits, so. <sighs> Looks like that's the end of it. The story of the ocean of stars, joy beautiful, sparkles with gods. <sighs> that was a great game. That was a great story. And I'm glad that I got to share it with you guys. And I will, of course, see all of you in the next video. See ya!